Hello, and welcome to Your Art Sucks, a podcast dedicated to helping artists create better art. And this is Episode 7, Complete Unknown, Thomas Pynchon and Daft Punk. In this episode, we will look at artists who've gone to great lengths to remain anonymous to stay out of the public eye and control how their image is used in the media. While such a feat may have been possible in the days before mass technology adoption, we know that the pursuit of anonymity in today's social climate with a person's ability to instantaneously capture still images and video and share them with millions of people only seconds later may prove impossible in the long term. Despite the odds, Artists from all genres continue to fight against celebrity to try and live a life outside of the media. While I will get into more of a discussion about privacy in the wrap-up of this episode, I did want to ask a couple questions for us to consider while we listen to the show. First, does the very act of being an artist require you to be identified? Second, is there any impact to the potential success of an artist if they choose not to be seen? Third, if one wanted to be invisible today, How would one accomplish this, with the eyes of the world only one click away? And lastly, is there any value in being invisible in a world that craves unending content? Is being anonymous the most freeing thing an artist can do? Before I get to the decades-long battle Thomas Pynchon had with the media, which continues to this day, I did want to bring up a couple things. Let me start by saying that the more I research this show, the more I realize how incredible being anonymous is. I mean, think about it. How fantastic would it be to be able to earn a living without the general public knowing who you really are or what you actually look like? I'm going to touch on this later, but take a second and think about how much your image, and by this I mean your actual physical representation, means to the marketplace today. Your appearance is worth money to companies like Facebook and Instagram. If they can tie a face to a chain of products you buy places you go, or services you use, and worse off, your political views, they can use that information to make money. So don't think that for a second your image is not sacred to big business and governments. Now, in regards to the focus of this podcast, which is based around art, we can see that the practice of hiding is still well used. In about 10 minutes of searching, I compiled quite a list of individuals who had, or currently have, eluded media and the public. While not an exhaustive list by any means, I did want to note that I'm not going to include reclusive types in this list as they're different from the anonymous types. Reclusive types may prefer to be left alone. They're far from being fully committed to controlling their image. Recluses will have in-person interviews, although begrudgingly. They will have images of themselves in the media when absolutely required. And the most glaring difference between a recluse and a person who craves anonymity is that they don't devote a tremendous amount of energy to avoiding the press or public when conducting their daily lives. Being a complete ghost isn't their goal. They simply just want to be left alone. So with that in mind, who would be included in a list of privacy practitioners? When it comes to musicians, we have guys like Buckethead, or Slipknot, or Blue Man Group, or Guar, or Doom, or at one time even Kiss. When it comes to street artists, We've seen a massive upsurge in identity controllers. We have Banksy, Kaiser, Icy and Sod, Maestro Urbano, Bleep.gr, and DD Bandaid. Authors also account in this group as well. We have people like Elena Ferrante and B. Traven. The list could go on, but I think the point's been made. Being an unknown, while thought uncool in high school, is now on par with being in the it crowd. And while the cool kids are doing their best to stay out of the yearbook, there's been one graduate of this school who's been ducking reunions for over 50 years. He's one whose reign as prom king of the invisibles has never been contested. And who is this artist? Well, it's none other than American author Thomas Pynchon. It's quite routine of me to give some recollection of the artist's life and provide a construct as it pertains to the episode's subject. But in this case... There's little worth in rooting around in Thomas's history to understand or establish a link that his privacy was paramount. For those of you who haven't heard of Thomas Pynchon, I can sum up that he's a well-regarded writer of such novels as V in the 1960s, The Crying of Lot 49 also in the 60s, and one of his most famous works, Gravity's Rainbow, 
published in the 1970s. But in regard to this episode, there's nothing I can point to specifically that would allow us to understand this supreme need for privacy. Well, that's not completely accurate. There were early signs in Pynchon's writings, like those in his high school paper, which continued to be a consistent theme in his later novels, and that was that paranoia was important to his character development. Take what you will from this, but there are few artists who don't incorporate aspects from their lives into their art. And if Thomas was indeed paranoid to some degree, then the need to remain anonymous would fit in with that mentality. There were those who would even point to Thomas's time in the U.S. Navy that may have spurred his need to remain secretive. But this is speculation. Because most of Thomas's life is shrouded in mystery, I will leave it to you to resolve the question of why he does what he does. And I will now move on to the equally important issue of how he's managed to remain a ghost all of these years. It goes without saying that any amateur artists early in their career are guaranteed to be off the map both socially and creatively. And when Thomas was starting out in the 60s, mass communication was tightly controlled by few media outlets, and there were very few opportunities to get exposure. To get your name into these leading publications, there needed to be an avalanche of voices behind you and your work. So for Thomas, this time required little effort for him to maintain his private lifestyle. But after the publication of Gravity's Rainbow, the 70s began to provide a bit of a challenge. But Thomas was up for it. At a mid-70s National Book Awards ceremony, his presence was replaced by legendary stand-up comedian Irwin Corey. What's funny about this, outside of the performance that Irwin gave, was that the audience, some were unaware that the stand-up comic wasn't actually Pynchon. The joke was completely lost on them. And after 20 minutes of Irwin riffing on the crowd, the night was highlighted by the presence of a streaker who ran through the normally formal event. Now, this whole shtick was the work of Tom Ginsberg, the publisher of Gravity's Rainbow. Now, he knew Thomas, and he also knew Thomas wouldn't show up. So Tom Ginsberg decided to put this little game to the audience, and it got a nod from Pynchon himself. Now, while this game was perceived to be humorous by most people in the audience, there was still this underlying, I guess, tension that people knew that Thomas was hiding. So now, there was something a little bit more serious about it. It was a living breathing entity, which now needed to be fed, or else expose the unwilling creator. The first real attempt at outing Thomas came from someone he considered a friend and confident. Jules Siegel, a fellow writer, did create a piece for Playboy magazine in 1977. The piece, while difficult to actually read due to its scarcity, was boiled down to Jules recounting his days with Thomas, who he found funny, self-conscious, highly intelligent, but shy and private to a fault. While I was unable to confirm this, others who've read the piece say it contained information that Pynchon had an affair with Jules' wife, so I'm not sure how shy he really was. The follow-up from the article wasn't ultimately revealing, but it did give the press many details they'd long for. They surmised enough from it to be able to shape together the past of this novelist, which confirmed that the picture that the New York Times had published in 1974 that they at the time believed to be Pynchon in his Navy days, was indeed the author, although a much younger image of himself. I've included this picture in the show notes if you want to see it for yourself. We can see that even this lack of high-speed access to countless databases at their disposal, news reporters of the day were very skilled at pulling the strings to get the results they wanted. Now, no one would call this picture for the article a home run. It didn't really reveal Pynchon to the world but they were on the right track. For Thomas, it must have appeared that this once tame animal he created was growing wild. But just as the scent of Pynchon was the strongest it had ever been, for some reason, the vigor to capture this elusive personality seemed to wane in the 1980s. As grateful as Thomas was to not have his image in the public eye, he was equally as effective as not having his words spoken on the lips of book readers. This time saw little production outside of articles and a publication of early short stories. As Thomas knew, not producing work was a surefire way to remove yourself from the public eye. He also knew that the public memories were short, and there were far too many other artists who wanted that spotlight that you shied away from. But then the 90s hit, and things were about to get very rocky for Thomas. Immediately after his new book, Violin, was published, The press was 
invigorated once again to take up the challenge to find him, and finally put to bed the decades-long mystery. With the numerous technological advances made since the 70s, the press corps had new tools at their disposal. Now, normally it would take a team of highly skilled private investigators to really dig up somebody who wanted to remain hidden. But with this rudimentary thing called the internet at hand, they were able to connect some dots they couldn't do before. Further to this tool, there was also the matter of Pynchon's life taking a positive turn. During the early part of the 90s, Thomas married his literary agent, Melanie Jackson, and they had a son in 1991. While it wasn't a public spectacle, it was more information for the press to add to their dossier, which was now starting to flesh out some real concrete details. It seems that with Thomas getting married, documents had to be filed with the courts, and for the right amount of money, these documents could become public. And from this, the last important piece of the puzzle would emerge, that Thomas split his time between New York and Mexico. The Mexico portion was already known, as other reporters had gone to Mexico when V was first published to try to find him and photograph him for a book review. But in classic Pynchon style, he was able to evade the reporter and take a bus seven hours away to a remote part of the country. But even Thomas couldn't have written what would happen in 1997, and it would shift the balance of power back in the hands of the press. While walking in New York, a CNN film crew had been looking for Thomas, as they had uncovered, with the help of that aforementioned internet, a simple cross-reference of his credit card number, which spit out his address. Now how they got his credit card number, I have no idea. But you can see why Thomas might have been paranoid, can't you? So this crew was basically laying in wait for him, and using the very old photograph the Times had already printed in the media as a basis. They were quick to spot their prey and with lightning speed, they struck out of hiding and closed in to make the kill. And in that very instant, decades of successful evasion came to a crashing halt. Pynchon had been found, and his image was now captured for all to see. Angered by his invasion of privacy, he called CNN asking that he not be identified in the footage of the street scenes near his house. When asked by CNN, Pynchon rejected their characterization of him as a recluse. He remarked that, My belief that recluse is a code word generated by journalists, meaning this person doesn't want to talk to reporters. CNN also quoted him as saying, Let me be unambiguous. I prefer not to be photographed. In a stroke of luck, the CNN team decided that they would be better suited to abide by Thomas's wishes, and they didn't call him out in the video piece. But they still ran with the footage, and they aired it on national television. I provided a link to this footage in the show notes, but it's interesting to point out something here. Yes, he was captured by video, but he was captured by video at the time, and it was very poor quality, as you'll see if you watch it. There's little chance you'll be able to point him out. You have to give Pynchon another victory, as the chance that anyone could have taped them with their VCR off the news the exact moment that it was played on CNN is extremely low. There were no PVRs or 4K cameras. There were no sites that replay video in an unending loop to be able to nail down the author's image. It was the 90s, like I said. Technology just wasn't able to out him definitely just yet. Now, unfortunately, the very next year, a reporter for the London Sunday Times, his name was James Bone, he managed to swap a photo of him on the Upper West Side in New York as he was walking with his son. Now, to me... That's very invasive and troubling that someone would be so desperate to photograph the author that they would also destroy the privacy of the child's life as well. I know it happens so often today, but I still feel that there has to be a hard line in the sand when it comes to things that should remain private. Now, this is unless the artist chooses to allow these kind of images to go public. Needless to say, I've seen the photograph of Pynchon and his son in my research, and I'm not going to be linking it in the show notes. Beyond this last invasion, Thomas had continued to live the life of privacy he so craved. The lust for the newspapers held for printing his image had long since waned, as they'd been confronted by many more modern artists looking to follow in Thomas's footsteps. Plus, the jig was up. Somebody was able to beat everyone to the punchline, and now the shine had worn off the chase. So even though Thomas had lost temporary control of his image, he actually gained so much more privacy. 
And now the irony of the whole situation is that in a time when anyone, and I mean literally anyone, could find Thomas and photograph him, he has more privacy now than ever. Now let us switch to a musical duo who also love to employ anonymity in their artistic pursuits. And while this tandem didn't have the same success that Pynchon had, well, few have, they were able to use their efforts to draw even more attention to their work. I speak of the Parisian helmet-clad robotic DJs, better known as Daft Punk. For those of you who are unaware, Daft Punk are masters at electronic music and have been awarded numerous music awards, including six Grammys and two Billboard Awards. Their song, Get Lucky, and that was performed by Pharrell and Nile Rodgers, was also awarded Record of the Year. And on YouTube, that song currently has 189 million views. Now let's look at how this band moved into anonymity. Created in 1993, when Guy Manuel, Deomem Cristo, and Thomas Bengalte decided not to further pursue their indie rock band, Darlin, with fellow musician, Laurent Brankowitz. The name Daft Punk came from a negative review Darlin received from Melody Maker Magazine music's critic, Dave Jennings. He called their music a daft, punky thrash. But it's more important to note that at this point, both of these artists were not fully vested in protecting their identity. In Darlin and the early years of Daft Punk, they would pose for photos and appeared on magazine covers. I've included an image of one of these magazine covers in the show notes. For some reason, though, a switch began to occur within the duo. Their outward personas began to change. And in an interview with Jockey Slut magazine, not long after the group's formation, Guy Manuel was quoted as saying, We don't want to be photographed. We don't especially want to be in magazines. We have a responsibility. But oddly, around this same period, they did allow a French film crew to film them for a television arts program. The only stipulation was that the program was not allowed to use their real voices, because Daft felt, well, they felt that to do so was dangerous. Now, whatever this meant, I'm not sure. But we're seeing at this point the desire for control over their image, well, it was beginning to take shape. The need for privacy would show itself in interviews after this time, as the band would wear masks or have their face digitally altered. At first, this practice was only intermittent, and they did perform concerts and clubs without the use of any facial concealment. And during their homework years, which was from the mid to late 1990s, the duo would become more consistent in their vision and wear a variety of masks to hide their appearance. Thomas noted that the foundation for a lot of what we were artistically is from the 1974 musical rock opera horror film Phantom of the Paradise in which the title character predominantly wears a mask. They've also alluded to being inspired by the French electronic group from the 70s called Space. This band wore helmets and spacesuits whenever they performed. And to me, in the research I did, the reasonings for obscuring identities seemed to be, well, in the beginning, more drawn from a theatrical desire over some kind of Pynchon-esque obsession. As the team entered the 2000s, they began to experiment with altering their appearance to the point that they included designers into the mix to bring their image to the next level. So robot-like masks were created. I mean, hell, if if they were going to be faceless, they at least wanted to look good doing it. And while the masks were extremely uncomfortable, not to mention hot to the point that they would almost pass out when they were performing, it was the only real option they had. Throwing on some face paint like the rock band Kiss, it just really wouldn't cut it 20 years after the fact. Well, let's face it. After David Bowie, face-painted musicians, they just wouldn't resonate with the electronic club kids Daft Punk's music was finding a home with. Now, with these masks, and with engineering done by Tony Gardner and the Altarian team, they were also capable of various LED effects. Now, wigs were originally attached to both helmets, but the duo removed these just before the outfits were publicly unveiled in 2001 which was a very wise thing to do in hindsight. Now, club kids weren't the type to ask why Daft Punk were wearing robot masks. They appreciated the futuristic look and cool effects. But reporters and interviewers? They would always start out with the same question. The hell's up with the helmets? Now, Thomas responded to one interviewer as follows. 
We didn't choose to become robots. There was an accident in our studio. We were working on our sampler, and at exactly 9.09 a.m., September 9, 1999, it exploded. And when we regained consciousness, we discovered that we'd become robots. Now you can see what's happening here, can't you? The act of wearing a disguise was drawing attention from fans and media. And early in the career as they were, such visibility was a boon to Daft Punk. They were instantly recognizable by those in the electronic music scene, and for those who resided outside the techno beat and baseline driven existence, it was something different. And more importantly, for the mainstream media, it was a mystery. And who the hell were Daft Punk anyway? As their popularity continued to grow in the 2000s, their music received continuous airplay and their videos were in heavy rotation on all the video music channels. The challenge to keep up with the separation between public and private life would experience the same difficulty Pynchon battled in his long career. Funny enough, though, while the press was interested in unmasking them with the same furor CNN and the New York Times reporters had for the fabled author, Daft Punk fans were they were indifferent to the charade. Yes, the helmets were a distraction, a rock opera illusion, but only to those who held old school views of what musicians should be and what they should look like. Their art was far more important to them and their fans. And as for critics, well, they never really gave interviews anymore anyway. But on a rare instance, they would let forth a statement concerning their views. For instance, Thomas, who was the more vocal of the two, let it be known how they felt about fame and stardom. He said this, We don't believe in the star system. We want the focus to be on the music. If we have to create an image, it must be an artificial image. The combination that hides our physicality and also shows our view in the star system. It's not a compromise. We're trying to separate the private side and the public side. It's just that we're a little bit embarrassed by the whole thing. We don't want to play this star system thing. We don't want to get recognized in the streets. Everyone has accepted us using the masks in the photos so far, which makes us happy. Maybe sometimes people are a little bit disappointed, but that's the only way we want to do it. We think the music is the most personal thing we can give. The rest is just about people taking themselves seriously, which is all very boring sometimes. Now, in that same interview, Thomas goes on to say something so vital to the point of this episode. Now, this is a really long quote, so bear with me. But he answered this to this question. When asked if fame can be avoided, he said, Yeah, I think people understand what we're doing. I know many people who maybe like the way we're handling things. People understand that you don't need to be on the covers of magazines with your face to make good music. Painters or other artists, you don't know them, but you know what they're doing. We are very happy that the concept in itself is becoming famous. In France, you speak of Daft Punk, and I'm sure millions of people have heard it. But less than a few thousand people know our face. Which is the whole thing we're into. We control it. But it's not us physically, our persons. We don't want to run into people who are the same age as us, shaking our hands and saying, can I have your autograph? Because we think we're exactly like them. Even girls, they can fall in love with your music, but not with you. You don't always have to compromise yourself to be successful. The playing with masks is just to make it funnier. Pictures can be boring. We don't want all the rock and roll poses and attitudes. They're completely stupid and ridiculous today. Now that's a great quote. There's a lot in there. And I think it sums up exactly what Daft Punk was trying to do. They want to be out there. They want their music to be out there, but they want their private lives to be private. Now, similar to Pynchon's experiences, Daft Punk too eventually had a general acceptance that they were two people who didn't want their faces shown, and the media moved on. The duo continued to redefine and refine their look, but with little fanfare. They grew to just be more faces in an already overcrowded music scene. But their music never lost its appeal. And as recently as last year, Daft Punk performed at the Grammy Music Awards with singer The Weeknd to do their new song, I Feel It Coming, a song that would eventually be another chart topper and would also introduce this now quarter-century-year-old band to new tweens and teens who seem oblivious to the need for privacy in any way, shape, or form. To them, 
the opportunity for such privacy is kind of a dead concept. Their whole lives are lived online. So two guys in masks? Well, they don't get it, but they also don't care. So now that we've looked at the very talented people in this episode and how they use their anonymity and their artistic processes to separate their personal lives from the spotlight, it's time to have a look at the impact of such an endeavor and answer the questions I posed at the beginning of the episode. If you recall, the first question was, does the act of being an artist require you to be identified? Does your personal life need to be part of the package? Well, for some artists, like actors, you have no choice but to be visible. It's kind of your job. Your physical presence is a large part of the art. But the great thing about acting is that while your physical body is necessary, your personal identity isn't. The very definition of your job is to be seen as other people, to bring life to the lives of characters you've been tasked with playing. So the reality is, your privacy can remain truly yours. Well, that's if you're able to stay out of the spotlight, which can be easier said than done. For artists of other mediums, you're far more fortunate in that you have the innate ability to dictate how you're presented. As we heard in this episode, you can remove your physical presence from all forms of media if you so choose. Even if you currently have a social media presence, it doesn't have to stop you from creating a new artistic identity for yourself. One of the advantages of today's world is that you can go as far as you want to with this, to the point of being nothing more than a hologram or an avatar if you're so inclined. Just look at the band known as the Gorillas. They're literally just cartoons, complete digital creations. But in spite of this, they've performed at concerts, they've done interviews, and they've sold millions of albums. I mean, sure, they have real voices, and the voices belong to some famous musicians. But the band themselves? They're physically nothing more than ones and zeros. So to answer this first question, we can certainly say no. You don't need an actual identity to be a successful artist. It won't be easy, but with your creative abilities, it can be 100% doable. Now the next question posed was whether or not being anonymous limited the potential of an artist. I think after hearing what we heard today, it's obvious that in no way this creates any barrier to your success. There may be awkward moments for sure, and the media may lash out at you as they grow frustrated with your attempts to sandbox them in when you deal with them. But that's their issue. And to push this point further, I'm going to be so bold as to state that if you execute properly, being anonymous can have the effect of increasing your potential, especially in your early career when exposure is so vital. Give the media something interesting to create a headline off of, and you may be well ahead of your peers. Now, both the third and the fourth questions essentially come to the same end point, so I'm going to kind of wrap them up together. If you wanted to be anonymous, could you do so in a connected world? And would the effort of all this work have a freeing effect for the artist? As difficult as it may seem, the ability to be anonymous today is really no harder than when it was back in the 70s. I say this because if you really think about it, the internet is kind of a one-way street. It requires our participation in order for it to be used against us. I'll grant you that celebrities, sometimes they don't have a choice but to be thrust in the media without their consent. It's definitely unfair, and it's a hazard of the job. But if we look to what we can control, we can refrain from uploading images to Instagram, tweeting, posting to Facebook, or sharing every detail of our lives with it online. Think about it. It's a beast that needs feeding. Now, to be truly effective, this also requires that those who know us, like our friends and family, they also respect our need not to share as well. If you can square this away, then you can be a digital ghost. I call this the pension approach. And yeah, it takes a hell of a lot of effort to ensure that it stays in place. One single slip-up, and the game is over. The world knows who you are. Now, there's another side of this coin, and I call this the Daft Punk approach. This is one where, well, it might be a little bit more fun. In this practice, you take full control of how the media reports your image. You come out front and center, but with a twist. Now, this can take the shape of digitally altering your appearance, or you can be an avatar, as I said before, or you can be an online presence that's nothing more than a stock image. 
the digital playground has no rules. So you're completely free to be who or whatever you want. And what you really want is to be nothing. The only caveat is that your work speaks louder than your persona. Daft Punk were really just a couple of guys who wore cool helmets, but it was their consistent hit music that made their appearance an eventual non-issue. Whatever course you plot to achieve this, know that either way can result in complete freedom for the artist. In some ways, being anonymous today is one of the biggest achievements a person can attain. To wholly own your image and identity as a separate facet of your life can be entirely liberating. Can also allow you the freedom to create art that isn't bound to you and the limitations that are placed on you as an artist. Everyone wants to box you in, but if you're a ghost, then you cannot be pinned to an ideology, a race, a sex, or a culture. And that, that's the most enviable position for an artist to be in. Because at the end of the day, your art is all that matters. Let the media and the internet focus on that. Well, that's a wrap for this episode. I know there's a lot to consider, and I hope that you see the value in keeping some aspects of your life private. You need times in the day when your life is just completely yours to enjoy. I want to thank you for joining me. I love the idea that artists are getting something out of this podcast, and it makes all the work that goes into each episode worth it. Now stop listening to me, and go make yourself a digital ghost. Ghost.